of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So when I came over at 7.30 this morning to get ready for the 8 o'clock service and I realized that the reading in the Gospel book did not match the reading in the inserts on the Sunday when we have the time change, I thought, really? <laughs> so... Let me read to you what's in your bulletin. You can just relax and listen. This also is from the Gospel according to John. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. So the interesting thing about the double gospel uh, this Sunday morning is that the collect about Jesus as being the true bread fits better with the gospel that's in our gospel book that I read when we came down the aisle this morning. The gospel in our bulletin fits very clearly with the reading from Numbers. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too will I, Jesus, be lifted up. So I'm going to get to both Gospels, but I'm going to start with numbers. Because I love this, there's this one sentence. The people are out in the wilderness, and they're complaining. There is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. But you just said there was no food and we detest this miserable food. The miserable food that they were detesting was manna. God was miraculously feeding the people with manna out in this wilderness where there was no food. Every day, the manna would be there, and the people would gather it, and they would be sustained, and they would be fed. And for the people of Israel, in this instance, in this story, oh, manna again. We just ugh, detest this miserable food. And so, according to the story, there are these poisonous snakes that show up and start biting the people of Israel. And they start dying. And they make the connection that, oh, well, we complained about what was for dinner. Maybe we shouldn't have. And they ask Moses, you know, pray. Pray to God for us, please. And so according to the story, Moses is giving this really bizarre instruction from God. Make a bronze serpent and put it on a, on a pole, on a standard, like you would carry a banner before you went to battle. Put it on a pole, and whenever anyone's bitten by one of these poisonous snakes, they are to look at the serpent on the pole, and they will not die, they will live. That just sounds so like, wait a minute, I thought we were worshiping one God, and this sounds pretty much like idol worship. What the heck is going on? So I decided to do a little Googling around in preparation for this sermon. And rather than going to the Christian commentators, I decided to see what the rabbis had to say about this. 
because it's all well and good for the gospel writer of John to make the analogy between the serpent on the pole and Jesus the Messiah. But what do the rabbis have to say about this? And they had some really interesting reflections. So I recommend to you, go check it out. See what the rabbis have to say about anything, any of our Old Testament readings. It's, it's sure to give you food for new ideas. And so I came up with my own sort of little ah mm, about the serpent on the pole. As human beings, we often turn things into idols that are meant to be signs, as John would say, reminders to us of what's going on with God and with our relationship with God. You see, the people were having to rely on God, and their sin wasn't actually about complaining about the food. It was complaining about having to trust God for the food. The issue was a trust issue, not what's for dinner tonight. The serpent on the pole meant that their healing, according to the story, had nothing to do with them. Didn't have anything to do with a medical solution. Didn't even have anything to do with magic. It had to do with a reminder. That poisonous serpent, look at it and remember that you are going to be made whole and it's not going to have anything to do with you. It's going to be the free gift of God who has been sustaining you every day through your wilderness journey. The lesson is put your faith and trust in God and stop insisting on wanting to do it yourselves and wanting to do it your way. Okay, that's what I got out of my little trek into Google. So now in the Gospel of John, and a reminder that John is, unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not so much a telling of the story of the events and teachings and miracles that Jesus did among us, as it is a theological reflection on who is this Jesus and why did he come. And so in this particular passage of the gospel, the writer is holding up for us the image of Jesus crucified on the cross, and holding it next to the image of the poisonous snake on the pole. Because our salvation depends on God's love and God's grace, the free gift of God willingly given, just as much as healing for the ancient Israelites in that story from Numbers had to do with their willingness to allow themselves to be so vulnerable that they were depending completely and wholly on God to sustain them, on God to save them, on God to keep them alive. And the Gospel writer in our insert this morning is making the same point. It is, as Paul says in his letter this morning, the free gift of God, not through anything that we have done ourselves. So, to go to the other gospel passage where uh, the, we have the story of the feeding of the 5,000, which is the only miracle of Jesus that appears in all four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have this account of Jesus miraculously feeding 5,000 people with five barley loaves and two small fish. Not a big fish, small fish. Um, so, something happened. Something happened. And in that reading, the gospel writer has Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. It is Jesus who gives us life, again, just as God provided the manna in the desert, in the wilderness wanderings for the people of Israel, so God has provided God's self to feed us in the person of Jesus, who in John says, I am the true bread which came down from heaven. Everyone who eats of me will live forever. The bread that I give for the world is my flesh, my life. So 
So we, just as much as the people wandering in the wilderness, we have a hard time giving it up for God. We, again and again, want to do it ourselves, our way. And that will never work. The only way that we can fully, fully live in the way that God longs for us to live is to become one with God. To trust that God in Jesus Christ has come to give us life, abundant life, here and now, and eternal life. And Paul, in Ephesians, in this letter this morning, says an interesting thing. God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised, past tense, it's already happened, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. We have already been raised in Christ. We have already, according to Paul, ascended into heaven, ascended into the reign and the realm of the living God. We have already been transformed, not through our own Lenten disciplines, not through our own efforts to live a good life, but through our willingness to trust the promise and word of God that in some mysterious way that we can't logically understand, God in Christ, willing to be human, willing to die and to be raised from the dead, that, that that's all that was necessary. And all we need to do is put our trust that that is true, to put our trust in God's promise that that's all we need to do. All we need to do. Trust that he has and always will provide all that we need to be truly alive in and through Christ Jesus. So that, as Paul says, so that we may live lives devoted to good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Because part of that transformation is not just that we get eternal life. Part of that transformation for us is that we now in Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, have the privilege of helping to transform the world. That is huge. It is part of why Christ came, not just to give us life, us here, us in the church, all of us in all creation.